Let's bring in now uh, social capitalist Chamath Pali Hapatia. He joins us once again uh, on the phone. Chamath, welcome back. Hey, Scott, how are you? I'm good. Uh, thank you for being here. Hope you've been well and safe and healthy since we talked to you last. So we, we've had a tremendous move uh, off of the lows since we saw you last. And you spoke of an environment which was coiled up for a, for a bounce. Are you surprised that we are now where we are? Um, not really, because I think that psychologically what we had gone through in that moment, um, you know, was basically coming to a reckoning around the amount of risk um, that people had and the lack of preparedness that they had for this kind of volatility, because we had, you know, basically seen no vol up until this period. Um, but really all we did when we tested the lows was allow people to essentially unwind a bunch of leverage and be generally better positioned. Um, but, you know, to be clear, from my perspective, what we have not done is trade the news. We've traded the risk. Um, and this rally is effectively our desire to essentially not listen to what I think is relatively evident and hope for the future. But the problem is that hope isn't a strategy. Um, and so much of this rally, I think, is a setup for um, what happens next. And I think the, the cherry on the cake was in many ways what the Fed did this morning, which was, to me, dumbfounding. Why, why dumbfounding? You know, what I, what I see actually is like the tale of two pandemics. And uh, if you just allow me for a second, you know, so if, if you look at what one tale tells you, um, you know, today we saw... 6 million new jobless claims. We think that we're going to have somewhere between, you know, 15 and 25% unemployment. So call 20% the midpoint um, across every single industry. In the absence of an artificial uh, supply side decision in oil, we could see an entire industry in the United States eviscerated. Um, we actually are now seeing incremental data that the damage to uh, companies and industries is much greater than we thought. So before it was isolated to tourism or hoteling, but yesterday, for example, New York Presbyterian came out and said they could lose up to $750 million. UCSF, which is a research hospital here in California, said they could lose up to a quarter of a billion dollars. Um, frontline primary care workers have been part of this new class of jobless claims. So this is, you know, people in doctor's offices, dentist offices going out of business. So we are now touching industries that in many ways were responsible for fighting this disease and helping us make sure that we could get back to normal, who are now the first to be affected. So that wave of damage has to really get unwound, and that $100 billion in the stimulus bill looks like it's woefully insufficient for that. Don't you think there's the going to be more? Time, don't, don't you think there's so, going to be more? I mean, the Fed basically put it all out on the table today. I, I shouldn't not, even say that. Really. They still have they still have more to do, they, and they will do more, and the government will do more. So, so as a, as somebody who owns tens of companies now, going through this PPP process is what I'll tell you is I think the results will be pretty haphazard and quite sloppy. Uh, the mechanisms in which to do it, the amount of money that's given, the requirements that once taken, just to give you a sense of it on the ground. What I will tell you again, the tale of two pandemics. This is just the first tale on the ground. When you do the math. If you're a company, you actually save more by furloughing people, cutting salaries, and letting people go than you would by getting PPP. And so the difficult decision that many CEOs are being forced to make is how much runway do they want? Do they want to get, you know, a few months of payroll relief, but then be forced to carry folks on longer in the absence and unknowingness of the revenue side of the business that they have? Or do they just let people go cut burn and basically save OPEX? That's an incredibly difficult decision. And I think what I'm seeing is many companies choose the latter. And you're seeing some of the best companies in the world deciding to furlough people and let people go. That's going all the way down the value chain to the smallest company. So that's on one side. That's, the, that's one part of this tale of two pandemics. The other side is what the Fed is doing, which is essentially is a decision to obscure price. And I don't think that it's a bad thing in the short term to create some amount of confidence when there's massive volatility. But at some point, I think what we need to realize is that unless we want a state-sponsored economy where the government owns most of everything, we are going to have to have a period when private market participants 
or public market participants like myself, like Josh, have the right to set the price. So, for example, if you look at Ford bonds today, I don't know whether Ford is a good business or a bad business. But what I do know is that when the Fed says, I am going to prop this company up and make sure that this leave or this tranche of debt, you know, does not basically fall into a place where it's tricky for them, obscures what the real price is that I would pay. And eventually, myself and every other public market participant will have to use all of our collective capital and decide what the true fair market clearing price of these assets are. And I think that is when there is this next wave of damage. And so what you have is you have um, an an obfuscation in the capital markets and a reality in Main Street, and they're not being reflected, and they don't reflect the same story right now. Okay, I want to, Josh, you want to, you want to comment on what Jamath is saying? I want, I want to kick this around. Yeah, I, I appreciate that point of view about um, the government obscuring uh, price, but the, the, the part I want to push back on is, First things first, from from BCA research, we've heard that 80% of layoffs are considered temporary by the employer or the employee or both. Uh, and that's new research uh, as of the last couple of days. Um, the second thing is that we're in a war. And in a war, the government directs the war effort and finances it. Um, and so part of fighting that war this time is not jet fighters and and battleships and aircraft carriers, it's financial liquidity and and medical, medicine. So we're fighting a war on that front, but it's still a war. We still have a a citizenry that is at risk of of death or or serious loss. And so when you think about it like a war, the, the idea of the Fed and the Treasury stepping in is no different than the idea of a taxpayer-funded military sending soldiers and, and, and materiel off to wherever the battlefront is. So I'm trying to think about it that I, way. It's less offensive. I, and then the last I, thing is I that we, we did not lose money in the last round of corporate bailouts. The government made money on the bank investments it had to make, on the auto industry, uh, AIG. Not that we wanted to do it. We were left with no choice. Chamath, there is no choice. No, no, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with what the Fed has to do. What I'm saying is that it, it's creating a landmine and it's creating a bill that will have to come due. And I think the point is that in 2008, we had a surface area which was relatively limited. We could contain what the problem was to a specific sector or to a specific handful of companies or to specific holders of specific instruments. This, as you say, is everything in the kitchen sink. It's everybody. It's everywhere. It's all industries. It's all companies. It's all sizes. So unlike 2008, what this means is this is the totality of the United States economy, and it's a large percentage of the world economy. So in that, there is a very simple binary thing that the governments have to do, which I agree with right now, which is to come in and prop up asset prices. But eventually those asset prices, just like in 2008, got priced to market. And in that turn, the United States government and the United States citizens who put up the money, we got a decent deal and we made a little bit of cash. My point is when you look at how broad-based the buying is here, it just won't be the case because there are some zombie companies that will get propped up. And when all of that gets priced into the market eventually, you're going to see a lot of financial carnage that maps to the actual carnage that's actually happening on Main Street. Jenny? Yeah. So I agree with something that Chamath said, which is that we're creating a landmine and the bill will come due at some point. This is something that we've been talking a lot about in house here and thinking about too. And we've been asking the question, when does the dollar weaken because of this? When does inflation kick in? When does permanent growth become a lot lower? So what we've been talking about, and I'm curious if Chamath agrees with this, to us at Gilman Hill, the way out of this is incumbent upon voters to, in the next rounds of election, be super conscious that we're voting for fiscally disciplined um, leaders who understand and can start to and can start to dig us out of this hole. That might be Pollyanna to think that it's possible. I'm not sure it is, but I think that we all need to recognize that we borrowed a lot, taken a lot. We were getting out of this because of it, but it is on us to be fiscally responsible for the next five to ten years, maybe twenty to thirty years what, to get out of, of it. One of the issues, I, Jenny. One, 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 Jenny, one of the issues in Shamath as well. We, why should we even I, be worried? Why should we even be worried about? 
quote unquote landmines at, at, at this point. No, Jenny's Jenny is totally right. I mean, look, we we are we are headed towards all the worst parts of Europe without the best parts. You know, it's all bad teeth. It's no mm-hmm. good food and architecture and long vacations. I mean, Europe for years has decided that they're just going to prop every random company up. They're never going to allow anything to fail. You know, the ECB will come in and, and buy debt and credit. I mean, it's ridiculous. And you've seen what's happened to the Eurozone, which is basically a, a, a slow, slow, slow decay to irrelevance and essentially a quasi-socialist continent. And so we have to decide what we want to see. You know, and some form of austerity may be required after this period of flagrant spending. You know, just to build on her point, um, we have just started to figure out the damage to states and municipalities. This is why the Fed today said half a trillion dollars to support states and munis. But we know that that's not going to be enough, because if you go state by state, city by city, county by county, what you will have is a very, very difficult political problem that these mayors and governors have, which is the following. This is the one chance, and the Fed just signaled it, for them to get a massive bailout. And so if you're running a city and you have unbelievably large unfunded pension liabilities, your revenue has fallen off of a cliff, you have no idea how you're going to provide essential services, this is the moment in time to delay your ability to go back to work, to to delay the way that you end the shelter in place, solely because the damage will be incrementally worse, which means you probably have a better chance of being a little bit further in line, ahead of the line, to get a bailout. And so that is an entire panoply of issues we haven't even started to touch. You know, we've talked about Delta Airlines or American Airlines or Carnival cruise ships or whatever, but what about the city of Houston, the city of Pittsburgh, you know, the state of Arkansas? Those are going to be issues. Um, I, I hear I hear you on all of that. And those are going to be issues that need to be dealt with. I'm I'm fairly confident that there's going to be more money, regardless of, of the landmines, if you want to use that word, that it creates down the road, that the, the right people are in place thinking about the very issues that you're talking about, Chamath, and that th- there is going to be money funneling to wherever it has to go. There is no alternative. Scott, there is a basic principle of capitalism, and maybe this is what we're getting to, which means at some point, you and I have to agree what the market clearing price is for risk and for an asset. And right now, what we have decided to do is pause that process. And at some point, all I'm saying is we will have to restart that process if we intend to have some form of capitalism in the United States. And we'll have a better idea, ideally, once the economy not only opens, but once you get further down the line where you can actually start to put some real thought behind what earnings are going to be and the multiple that you want to put on those. Right now, obviously, because of the unprecedented situation that we're in, and the level of engagement of the government and the Fed, it has done everything that you've said. It has obscured um, uh, price on a lot of things. But that's just... But it's the- not obscuring the damage. My point is the damage is still happening. This is why I'm saying it would be one thing if what we were doing is literally cutting checks to humans. And that's all we did. Meaning there would be no price obfuscation there. Um, what we would see is probably inflation right out of the box but at least it would be a consumer-driven rebound that we could think about as highly probable. Then you could talk about earnings and whatnot. But to your point, what we've now done is divorced ourselves from reality. And the more we do these programs, again, I think we need to do some form of this for a while, but the more we continue to do it, we're going to exacerbate the hangover that we have because it's not going to help as many individual people as you think it's going to help. And all it's doing is propping up asset prices. It would be better for the Fed to have given another half a trillion dollars to every man, woman, and child in the United States. Well, how is this crisis changing the way you invest, if at all? Well, the first thing that it's made me realize is that um, as bad and dislocated as the equity markets are, and what I mean by that is um, people have just basically said, I throw them up my hands in the air. I'm essentially going to be net long. I refuse to think about earnings. 
uh, I'm going to assume that it's a one or two quarter aberration. So I've, I've decided to basically step out of the equity markets in the public side for the time being, because I think they are not reflective of what's happening on the ground. Where there is more reality is in the credit markets and in private markets. And I'll give you an example. Um, you know, two days ago, there was a transaction where Slack, where I led the Series A and, you know, we took it public last year. We did a, a convertible bond issue in the, in the public market. $750 million, 0.5% coupon, 24% uh, premium on the convert price. And then Airbnb did a convert the same day, a billion dollars, 11.5% uh, was the midpoint, 1% warrant coverage at a 50% discount. So you have a price maker and a price taker. What you would say is that the public equity and capital markets um, essentially allows Slack raise as much money on whatever terms they wanted. Uh, Airbnb basically, you know, had to essentially go to a loan shop. And so there is a massive dislocation in private markets right now, which is going to create a large opportunity for buyers like me who can understand and sit through different technology companies and what their true cash flow streams over the long time will be. The second, and, you know, Josh mentioned this very early on, but there's been this amazing phantom rally in junk high yield um, but if you go through the high yield index, what I will tell you is there are an enormous and growing number of zombie companies that will not exist in five or 10 years. And again, at some point, the bill comes due and somebody has to price these assets to reality. And even more importantly, all this unsecured debt that has not gone to fund R&D, but has essentially has gone to fund paybacks and CEO compensation, uh, those unsecured debts have to get paid back. And the cash flows just don't exist, which means that these companies will go to zero. So in the credit markets, I think that there is an enormous body of opportunity. And in the private equity markets, there's an enormous amount of opportunities where folks like us can be price makers. Um, and the companies essentially are price takers. But in the public equity markets right now, if you have any reasonable way of just saying this is a one or two quarter aberration, you're going to be given a hall pass for at least the next nine months, which means that the buying opportunities in public equities are limited to none. What do you think the other side of this is going to look like? I, I, I really think that this is very similar um, to what Bill Gates has been saying for a while. Um, like if, you, if you're really honest with yourself, and if we are really honest with all of ourselves for a minute, what do we know now that we, that we didn't know two or three months ago when this started. And honestly, what I would tell you is not much of anything. We don't know much more today than we knew in January. We're not that much closer to a vaccine. We're not really sure what the half-life of this disease is. We don't know what the real r not is. We don't know what the CFR is. Um, we don't know, um, you know whether you even express antibodies. If we do, we don't know whether it's reliable. We don't know how long those antibodies last. So. You know, if you really write this down on a piece of paper, the reality is we have the same open questions we had in January. So to your point, and so I'm sorry to interrupt you, Chamath. Let's listen to, in fact, what Bill Gates told our Becky Quick this morning on Squawk Box, and then let's react to it on the other side. It plays right into what we're talking about now, and I, I would like to hear uh, from Bill Gates. No one should think the government can wave a wand and all of a sudden, you know, the economy is anything like it was before this happened. That awaits either a miracle therapeutic that has an over 95% cure rate or broad usage of the vaccine. Same point you're making. He's completely right. And so, you know, in a different way, basically what, what we're saying is we really don't know much more than we knew back then. And so we're still waiting. We have a lot more hope. We have more optimism. And what we're seeing is the effects of courageous action by our frontline workers. So I think when you think about that, the reality of an economic restart to me is much murkier than people think, which is exactly as Bill said, it's going to be very difficult for large swaths of people to congregate and be beside each other doing tasks, enjoying life for the foreseeable future until we know that either there is a cure, meaning you go to your doctor and you get an injection that'll protect you, or if you get sick, that there's a way with 95%, as he said, efficacy that you're cured. Otherwise, Scott, what I would be telling you is the following. Hey, uh, 
Scott Wapner, go to your job, do your best. I can't guarantee you that you're safe. I can't guarantee you that the guy beside you is safe. If you care about your elderly father or, you know, your brother or sister who's immunocompromised, maybe you work at home if you can. If you can't just come in, there may be a therapeutic. It hopefully kind of works, but I can't guarantee you that either. And if you die, I'm really sorry, but we try our best. That's where we are today. And that's why we're so not that's economic, that's why we're not going back to work today. So an economic restart will not in the next four or eight weeks address any of those core structural issues, which is again why I say we're 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 in a point right now where the capital markets are still very much divorced from Main Street. And at some point we do need to tie these two things back together because this is how the United States is the most important vibrant economy in the world. The capital markets should reflect what happens on the ground at companies by people. And right now it does not. Sure. With, with look, I, I think it's important to repeatedly say with an asterisk, with a caveat that this time, this is what has to happen. It would be it would be almost when 08, we're having this big dis discussion, Chamath, about, you know, the Fed and their bailouts and this, that and the other thing and whether there was a moral hazard. Well, I think you can make the, the argument that this time it would be almost immoral not to to do what the government and the Fed are doing to help make people, in Jay Powell's words, whole because of a situation that they were forced into. We're not we're not we're not. Let's be clear. We're not making people whole. OK, but you We're get the, the but you get the point, the, but you, you get the oh, point. God, no, I don't. I don't get the point. I don't get the point because it's not accurate and it's not fair. And it makes it basically, you know, treating the American people as if they're stupid. We're not stupid. OK, if you wanted to make us whole, you would basically take last year's W-2 for every single United States citizen and say, guys, I'm going to give you the monthly wages that you got last year until this thing is over. That's how you could make us whole. But by plugging the holes of balance sheets, you don't make us whole. By stepping into markets that none of us have exposure to, to buying illiquid assets off the balance sheets of banks, you don't make us whole. That is not doing anything for the average person every day. Okay, the average person got about two weeks of salary relief. That's all they got. And they need more. It's not enough. They need a lot more. Boy, there's no disagreement. There's no disagreement at all about that. But I'm saying that's been less than 10 cents on the dollar of what's been spent right now. So all I'm telling you, Scott, is that there is good intentions. But typical in, in form, we are misallocating vast swaths of money. And in it, what we're doing is we're creating a bigger problem that has nothing to do with how people work or recover. It has everything to do with how balance sheets are valued how assets are valued, how net asset values are calculated, how LPs get K-1s. This has nothing to do with an average person, the firefighter, the policeman, the doctor, the nurse. Look, I, don't, I, don't, I do, do not disagree any. with you on that. And, and, and it, it, we're going to once again have to have the, the, the painful and unfortunately too long-lasting conversation of, of income inequality. And in many ways of what is happening now may accentuate that even further on the other side of this. I, and, I, and, I say, I have, and I say too long of a conversation because it seems to continually expand without truly getting dealt with. And the unintended consequence of this entire situation that was the fault of nobody is going to be. I understand. I understand. But you know what? Being the fault of nobody is not an excuse for doing the right thing and being compassionate now. So all I'm saying is if Jay Powell is listening, what I would tell him is this. Everything you've done, I applaud. Thank you for doing it. But from here on out, look out for individual people above all others. If the Fed is literally willing to do everything, do things first and foremost for American citizens, one by one, every man, woman, and child. Get money in the hands of individuals. Replace their lost income. Don't prop up assets. Don't obfuscate price. It's not going to help anybody. All you're doing is having money wash around the financial system, which is all about hedge funds, banks, large family offices. Guys like me, we don't need the help. Joe Terranova, do you have something for Chamath? 
Yeah, I think that's a great point with Chamath just said. I do think individuals need the assistance. But Chamath, you obviously are painting a, a narrative that's that's rather ominous for risk assets. And we as speculators, you and I, we participate in these capital markets. For the viewer listening to you now, when you look across the asset class landscape, where is it that you see the the largest richness and are you taking a position in that capacity thinking that it's overpriced? That's a, thank you for asking this, Joe. So this is why I think in the credit markets right now, my entire focus has been where are opportunities where I can loan to own or where can I buy, you know, tranches of debt where I can step into these companies and save them. And my thought is there are some incredible businesses right now that are going to get in very precarious trouble. The odds that, you know, the Fed shows up with a bazooka for every single company in the United States, I think is so low which means that guys like me can step in and help preserve some really good companies that, frankly, make products in the United States that keep good American men and women employed. And I think that, to me, is where I'm spending my time because that's what I can do. You know, I can't build a vaccine. I can't find a therapeutic. Um, but I can, you know, shore up a business, make them be more efficient, figure out how to be more resilient, invent new products, keep people employed, hire more people, um, and so I'm spending a lot of time in the credit markets right now trying to figure out businesses where I can be a lender of record, I can participate in that transformation through this pandemic and help these guys. And I think that's that's what I can do. It's not a lot, but, you know, I'm going to try my best. Josh? I, I guess I, I would say I would say uh, to Chamath on the issue of, like, the right way to get stimulus to people, I totally agree with him that it's very indirect to um, be giving it to small business owners uh, to keep employees, to give it to mid-sized enterprises, which they talked about today, um, or, or to do like airline bailout with, with half a trillion. I completely agree. It takes a long time for that impact to be felt. The problem is that's really the only transmission mechanism we've ever used and we've ever had. And to say that the danger is when we come like Europe, mailing checks of cash to people is the most European thing I've ever heard. So almost like, which is it? And then the last thing is, I don't like that it's this way, but it is this way. We have built the economy based on the wealth effect. That is the only engine of economic growth we have. Um, meaning there's $5.7 trillion that American people have saved in the stock market, usually 401k and IRA. That money then becomes quote, institutional money or hedge fund money or mutual fund money, but it's really people's money. And it's pension money on top of that, which is firefighters and and, uh, and nurses and, and teachers. So it's not too different money. It's people's money that's managed by institutions that's in these corporate stocks and bonds. So I, I think it's like, it's very hard to say that there's a faster, more effective way. I do think that we should be doing more on unemployment insurance, but other than that, I don't think we can wrap dollar bills in brown paper bags and drop them in people's laps. And most of the economy requires stocks and real estate prices and asset prices to rise because that's what fuels more spending and that's what keeps more people employed. I'm not saying it's good. I'm just saying that's what it is. Chamath? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I fundamentally agree. I mean, the first thing on Europe is the most European thing is what we're doing now, which is we're actually propping up zombie companies. Um, it's not giving money away because Europe doesn't really do that in as broad way as possible. They have good subsidized social services, but they don't just hand out money to people. Um, now, in terms of like how the economy works and this idea that, that the capital markets are flooded with average people's cash, yeah, it's true, but then there's this intermediary that steps in, which are these ETFs and these large bulky organizations. You know, these people aren't forecasting. These people aren't thinking about which businesses they need to own. These people are running you know, low load or no load funds. Uh, they own 80, 90, 100 companies trying to match indices and trying to do that as cheaply as possible. They don't understand company A from company B, so they're not trying to help a company by getting them incremental capital. Um, they're just running a simple business and getting paid for it. And, you know, the people that pay the price, in fact, are the pension funds and individual owners who own products through this level of indirection. You know, this is a moment in time where when you have grave consequences, you have to have strong, powerful, courageous action. You know, we had more technological advances because of World War II, not in spite of World War II. 
You know, we had great social reform because of the Depression, not despite the Depression. And so Americans have this great ability in moments of crisis to step up and clean off the cobwebs and do what's right and do things that are bold and decisive. And so if UBI was something that we're trickling around today, it's probably something that we need to realize is much more important because we've always been a consumer-driven, GDP-driven economy. And until that changes, and I would say it shouldn't change, consumers are voters, they're voting for products that win, customers vote for products that win, we need to make sure that these consumers have more and more capital at their disposal and they will lead us out. And I think what we need is a political body who's willing to embrace the capability of people like us and people that are watching and the individual people who are capable of electing people, who are capable of going to war and dying for our country, that we are also capable of spending our way out and figuring out a solution. And so all this indirect capitalism does is it lines money in the pockets of the established masses, and then it indirectly eventually, 10, 5 cents on the dollar, gets the people that really need it. Let me, and I think that that, it was wildly wasteful and unnecessary. Let me lastly ask you one more question, Shamath, and I gotta run, I, gotta, I wanna get into another story. And I think we all agree with you that more money for Main Street is, is needed. Maybe not in spite of the, the money to all of these companies or whatever that make up the economy as well, that more money is, is, is needed everywhere, perhaps. Um, but are, are you suggest you keep saying propping up zombie companies. Are, are, you, are you arguing to let airlines, for example, fail? Yes. Why? I mean, how, how does that make sense in the broader scheme of, of the economy? Because it's not, because when you look at what it means, this is why I'm saying, like, this is a lie that's been purported by Wall Street. When a company fails, it does not fire their employees. It goes through a packaged bankruptcy, right? If anything, what happens is the people who have the pensions inside those companies, the employees of these companies end up owning more of the company. The people that get wiped out are the speculators that own the unsecured tranches of debt or the folks that own the equity. And by the way, those are the rules of the game. That's right, because these are the people that purport to be the most sophisticated investors in the world. They deserve to get wiped out. But the employees don't get wiped out. The pensions don't typically get wiped out. Why does anybody, does, I just understand, why does anybody deserve, using your word, to get wiped out from a, a, a crisis created like, like this? How does anybody deserve to get wiped don't. out? Well, but, but just be clear, like, who are we talking about? We're talking about a hedge fund that serves a bunch of billionaire family offices. Who cares? Let them get wiped out. Who cares? They don't get the summer in the Hamptons. Who cares? I mean, there are people, you, you don't think the employees, table, on, Scott. you don't if think you the employees of these companies table, own stocks? I mean, own their stocks, what? own the company's stocks? You can, you can look on Bloomberg and you can see what percentage of these companies are typically owned by. These, these things are owned by BlackRock. These things are owned by these huge, you know, amorphous organizations, ultimately downstream. And the employee owns a few hundred dollars or a few thousand thousand dollars of shares. Well, I just don't understand. So this is, like, is a, could, like a natural disaster. Why does anybody deserve to get wiped out? Wouldn't that be immoral in and of itself? No, because what's happening right now is what I'll tell you is on Main Street today, people are getting wiped out. And right now, rich CEOs are not, boards that had horrible governance are not, hedge funds are not, people are. Six million people just this week alone basically saying, holy mackerel, I don't know how I'm gonna make pay, you know my own expenses for the next few weeks, days, months. So it's happening today to individual Americans. And what we've done is disproportionately prop up and protect or, you know, poor performing CEOs, companies, and boards. And you have to wash these people out. Well, there's, we're going to continue the debate another day, Jamath. You, you've always given us something provocative to chew on. You did once again. Um, we'll do it again soon, I hope. Thank you for coming on today. Thanks, guys. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye. That's Shamath Palihapitiya. We're going to take a quick break. Up next, it's a story that's getting a lot of buzz on Wall Street right now. Audio recording.